to do so. Move we start recording. I got a couple. Well, this is one I always like to to show in class because it's 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 about a three minute video. And really, the best the way to title this video would be from an electrician's point of view. This would definitely be one where how not to do it because they were really 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 creative, which is just insane. But let me pull this. This should come up, I hope. Let's see here. You guys can all see that video now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start this because this oh, what the hell? Make sure it actually you can still see it okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, Everett, and uh, I thought I'd show you an interesting uh, little electrical trick that they got going on. This is the uh, garage door opener in the garage. We've actually got two garage door openers. There they are, two garage doors. You can see the cords kind of hanging off there. Let's follow the power cord and see where it goes. All right, so it kind of goes up into the rafters. And then down, down, down. And it's plugged into a surge protector. All right, that's pretty <laughs> safe. Let's follow that surge protector and see where that's plugged in. Whoa, uh -oh. what's that? Uh, what the heck? Like the surge protector into some kind of wall cord. So let's follow that, see where that goes. All right, let's go along the wall, and then up, and then out. All right, well, let's go outside and see if we can find where that goes. Yeah, this is so insane what they do. Just wait. You're going to love this. All right, we're on the outside now. Let's see if we find that cord. Oh, there it is. All right, so comes out of the wall there. Comes down, and oh, lovely. It's just sort of tacked to the fence here. <laughs> Fascinating. That is, wow, really. Kind of. Under the plant here. Then you see it comes up and it goes into uh, up against the main house where it runs over. Oh, pops in through there. Let's jump in. <coughs> and comes in, down. Oh, another amazing splice job to a plug, which is then plugged into one of these really puny little extension cords. Let's see where that goes. Down in through this door. Okay. This is sort of the little like tacked on laundry room. You come in here and oh my gosh. <laughs> it has been plugged in to the light socket in this room. So you get power to your garage doors presumably when you turn on this switch and then the surge protector, and then the garage door. Wow. For real. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's always a fun one. And there's there's a, you'd be amazed at how many. Hold on. Here. Oh, get back to me here. You'd be amazed at how many uh things you'll run into like that out there where people just are creative with electricity and not even, you know, they, they Hi, got I'm Rex oh, Moore with the Motley Fool. Turn that out. But they got enough, uh, just enough knowledge to be dangerous. It's kind of crazy. Everybody seen that video pretty good, okay? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll, you know, sometimes you'll come up to these houses and it'll be like, what in the hell have they done here? And it's just like, oh, my God. I How's mean, there were so that? many crazy. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's like so many violations there. And, you know, and this is, you know, some people will talk against it and stuff. But, you know, every every state has their own um, licensing thing, right? You don't have to be in the union or anything like that. But, I mean, it is, it's a, it's a, a damn tough test, but. There's a thing to be said about going down and actually being a licensed electrician. <laughs> um, usually it'd be something, you know, and it's, it's, uh, 
you know, that's not a, a, a requirement per se. I mean, you don't have to be a, a licensed electrician to, I'm not currently licensed anymore, but, um, but I mean, they do run this, you know, it's a state deal and you go down and um, you can, you pay your fee and take this like really long, really, it's actually a pretty tough test, but, and you get state license. That means you're legally allowed to practice in, in whatever just, you know, area you're in right and technically if you were to do like electrical work and not be licensed you're actually in violation um <laughs> it's like a thing they say you know you're licensed you're bonded and you're insured and that means you know you're well protected against anything that's uh that may go wrong and it protects like you know your customer as well that's just the primary thing so they can't like if you did do something inadvertently wrong you know and they do turn around and uh, try to sue you when you're bonded you know that that protects you from uh, them going after like your personal property and that kind of thing you know it'd be be a hell of a thing to end up doing some electrical work and have something crazy happen and then the next thing you know these people basically just took your house or something you know but uh <laughs> so you got to be careful out there but yeah usually when you get to about journeyman level you know after you've been doing it for a good five years or more you might start start you know like you want to go out there and start doing your own um, job bids and that kind of thing and like again you can you can do job bids you don't have to you don't have to have a license but you should and then, you know, once you get your license, you go around and, uh, and believe it or not, the bonding, you know, you can get a bonding insurance package usually for a pretty decent price if you were to operate like privately, you know, just doing your own residential job bids kind of thing. And uh, yeah, you get licensed and then, yeah, you can run around and uh, make job bids all day long and and start making some money that way, that kind of thing. Um, something to, think about in the future you never know it's hard to say where you'll end up <laughs> but um oh what did i have so today we kind of do a chapter we jumped ahead a little bit and chapter 27 and 29 and what this deals with is uh, service entrance and service entrance uh calculations you know what we're bringing in the the line drop from outside and uh, what we need to do for that there's uh there's certain requirements for stuff you know pretty common one even still this to this day you know there's the the mast which is basically a pipe that goes up and then uh amarin or whoever the logo you know comma and what whatnot they'll come in and uh splice into into your what your wiring is you have on the mast or, or in the underground surface if you will Believe it or not, um, the underground service actually will run you some money, whereas the overhead is typically free service. But a typical, depending too, it depends on how, how bad the route is for like an underground service. Um, power company can charge you anywhere from 2,500 and up to, cause they gotta come through and trench, you know? So they charge you and it can be up depending on how difficult the trench job is, like if they have to go under a road or something like that. <coughs> it all depends on the, uh, the location of the transformer for that particular residence. <coughs> Typically, they're on uh, the same side, but sometimes the transformer will be across the road and they got to go, and when they have to trench, they'll have to go underneath or something like that. So there's always, always check. But they, like Ameren and them, they actually even have a, like a little pictorial on even what they require as far as what you have to have as far as a hookup and stuff, which is always convenient. But that's what we're kind of jumping into looking at. Um, and I usually have an exercise. I have not it's like a lab exercise where based on the, on the drawings that you have for the building, you do a uh, uh, service entrance or calculation, if you will where you literally are going to go through and look at everything in the house as far as uh, power requirements are, are concerned. And I have the sheet posted up. It's like a four pager and I'm going to tell you, and it's numbered. So what I'm probably going to end up doing, I haven't done this yet before. Um, 
like I said, it's usually a lab, but I'll go through and um, make a blackboard like assignment for it because it is numbered um, like one through forty something I think or something like that. There's there's a lot of uh, a lot of calculations for this thing, but when you a lot of people are tempted to do it blindly, but if you look on the very last page of this uh, of this handout, there's um, it's specifics. It'll tell you like according to the number of the question and whatnot, like what formulas you might have to use and that kind of thing. Because some of this stuff you haven't used yet, but <clears throat> basically it's all the specifics you're required to have as far as figuring out what your what your service and you know what you're going to have to have for power. And we're talking about basically, you know, bringing it in from the, from the mass down to the meter box and then into your panel. And then basically figuring out how many branch circuits you're going to need. Essentially what, um, what would happen here is you would figure out what you're going to have to populate your, um, what your panels, your cabinet's going to have to have in it. As far as all the different branches are concerned, what utility, um, what utility hookups you're going to have, that kind of thing. So it's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good lab. It gets you into it. Basically, this would be something you would do, like if you were to start, like if you just, like if you were gonna do a job bid, right? You would have the uh, building prints is usually what they send to you. And you look at the building prints and what you do then is um, you go through something like this where you figure out the service entrance calculations, what you're gonna require, right? And then from that, you'll go ahead and make up um, a materials list. And then with that too, you also decide on what kind of time frame you, you know, what you're going to charge for labor. So you'd come up with your materials list, and then, um, and then this is usually depending where people are willing to take the hit, and they try to plan ahead, right? So you figure, well, I can do this and this amount of time, so I'll charge. You know, they try to come in a little under so they get the job, try to underbid your competitors or something. Sometimes this doesn't work out in your favor. Um, there can, you know, you never know. It's there's always unforeseen things that could happen, and sometimes you end up, um, which you'll take a hit on. Typically, is your labor, right? So it's not unheard of that a certain portion of the job you might actually be doing for free if you if you underbid too much. But it's just one of those. One of those things, like I say, typically you end up doing this after you after you're at journeyman level or up, right? But um, yeah, let's take a look at uh, here. I can get this going correctly. So yeah, we looked at the video, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly of how people can do things. You guys can see the screen, okay? Yeah. I hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, we look at chapter 27 with the uh, service entrance equipment, right? So what's your service drop, right? Um, at your overhead and up to a certain point that is owned by the utility company. And then at a certain point, then it's the homeowner. <coughs> Excuse me. So your service point, it's the point of connection that you'll have, right? Between, um, Basically, that's your junction between this is where the premise starts and this is where the, uh, where the power company starts. And we'll go through and we'll even, you know, and you figure this is like a basic for it. And there's, there are specifics on, uh, on depending on the pitch of the roof, you know, how high up you're looking at, how high up you have to be. And then there's always the thing with grandfather clause, right? So if it's already done and it's in, you don't change anything with it, it can be left alone. Too. But if you do change something, you know, your grandfather clause no longer comes into play. And then you have to update or upgrade that particular portion here. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, yeah, with the overhead service, you know, we look at the... Um, service raceways and fittings involved your meter meter socket now typically in a job like that what you would do is you would have the mast wired up and whatnot to a certain point and then of course the uh, power company will come in and splice into what you have laid out and you'll have this attached into the meter box but you won't have the actual meter socket that's something that also comes from the uh, power company so they would come out and basically splice in and then go ahead and put a, um, 
a meter plug into your um, into your panel or your little box that you have, right? The meter socket that's there. And then you have the main service disconnect. So from the meter socket, it would join through, and it all depends on what your hookup is. <clears throat> Some cases you're going through a pipe that's going through concrete, you know, if it's down in a basement or something. Um, if it's in a garage, you're going through the garage wall, that kind of thing. So it all depends. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's house specific. But then um, your main disconnect at this point is the meter socket, right? But then coming into the house, you have what they call the main breaker. So your three lines would come in. You got the two hots and the neutral would come in. And then your two hots are, of course, on the uh, main service breaker. And then from that, it feeds into the two branches involved on the sides, you know, and depending, they're all panels come in all kinds of flavors and sizes. You can have little bitty guys to extremely large ones. And it, it all depends on what the requirements are. Um, and again, it's, you know, like in the case of like the customer's case, right? How much are they going to spend on this? <coughs> So, and it's always a good rule of thumb to, you know, leave a certain amount of room for expansion, but in some cases you might only have like one or two um, spots open on the, uh, on the branch circuit feeders and it's kind of limiting yourself, but it, it, it's not unheard of, but that's your, typically what you would have. And it would come in, like I say, into your main panel and then at your main disconnect would be that uh, is your, is your main circuit breaker. And that's the one that's rated ever like if you had a hundred amp service, you would have a hundred amp uh, circuit breaker involved, 200 amp service, 200 amp circuit breaker, et cetera. So it all depends on what's being pulled in. Okay. And so we look at it and like I say, it's a three wire deal and, and it really all depends on, um, on the structure involved. <coughs> Like I say, um, things to think about, it will, and you'll see a little later on and in these chapters is the pitch of the roof, the way the mast will come up on it, um, and that kind of thing. So all of these will come into play. And again, you know, and, and, and if you have the underground service, of course, then you're gonna ignore that. But again, with underground service, it's regional as well, like how far down you have to go to be under the frost line and that kind of thing. So you always need to check what are my local requirements going to be here? And usually if you follow like the current, you know, the current revision of NEC, so the one coming out like the 2021 would be the most current, right? But if we follow 2017 at this point, we probably won't be an error. But so yeah, so typical, like I say, you'll see um, in the very beginning symbol here. Now that is the actual transformer, which would be out on, um, in our cases would be out on a pole. And so you see a big giant can out there, right? And then, um, and interesting enough, what they have, like those transformers, what they do and why they're in those big cans, the big can is actually, then you see the fins that are on the outside of it typically, that's all for heat dissipation. And believe it or not, if you were to open one of those up, that transformer is literally sitting in oil. It's like a big thing of oil. And that's why when they blow, like if uh, transformer windings were to go or something, you know, lightning hits it or whatnot, right? When they blow, what's happening is, is you're literally shorting out to that, uh, to the oil inside that can. And that's why those things go off like a, they almost sound like a little cannon going off in some cases. But that's what they'll have. It's that if you open up, and they even have jobs where you could eventually get into some weird electrician lineman style job where you go through and check oil levels on uh, on transformers that are out on the poles and replenish them as needed and not to say that this is not a dangerous job it is you know a lot when you see once you get into a lineman style job there's a there's a lot of factors you got to consider with safety and whatnot i might even show you guys um there's an interesting one of uh, a typical lineman's job in like the appalachian mountains right because they have um, like all those valleys, you know, because of the, the way the mountain ranges are. But if you look, the, the wiring literally will go from like the peak of the mountain to the next peak of the mountain. And so you've got like this huge valley dip in between, right? And then you got to ask yourself, okay, how in the hell does a lineman get up there to service that stuff? And they have a video out there. I'll probably 
maybe I'll show that to you guys on Monday. Um, but the guy gets out there on a helicopter, believe it or not, and they have this like crazy um, like pole that uh, you have to hit the line with to basically um, get your helicopter at the same uh, point of reference as the line. So that way, if you don't step on the line, you don't get zapped and electrocuted, right? But this guy literally takes from the helicopter, he has this like weird little sled that they place right on top of the, the lines. And this thing has like, a, it's almost like a little skateboard, if you will. And a guy literally just chugs along, I forget how many, you know, how many thousands of feet in the air he is up in there, you know, because eventually the helicopter goes away and this guy's just out on a sled with his, with all his uh, tools and whatnot. And he's just skating along the lines and making any repairs and stuff like that that he has to do. But they make uh, an insane amount of money, but I don't know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so, so yeah, this is a typical diagram. If you notice, okay, so in the beginning, we see those, uh, those two squiggly lines. Well, that indicates the transformer, which is out on the pole, okay? And then you have it come through, and then um, where you see that circle with the M, that's your meter, the meter socket. So either from a mast or from an underground service, you would have the main feed come into that meter socket. And there's actually a disconnect point. And this is how the, like if the Ameren or whatnot want to disconnect the, the service uh, to a premise, you know, if they haven't paid or for whatever reason, they'll come out and just literally pop the, uh, the meter off of the socket. So there's no way it'll conduct through. <clears throat> so you'll literally have a break from where like the service comes through and that, that, <clears throat> that is always live. You know, to keep keep that in mind. And then the other side is only live when the, the meter is actually play, plugged in. And then it'll go through and like I said, you'll have your main disconnect, which is the very first, if you, this little like half circle thing, that's indicating a, um, a disconnect point. And that's actually located inside of your panel. And like I said, that'll be rated however your service is rated. If it's 100 amp, you'll have a 100 amp breaker, 200 amp service, 200 amp breaker, and et cetera, right? And then the picture shows you and what those indicate are all the individual breakers feeding out to your, to your branch circuits. And it's a pretty typical, it's a very simplistic drawing, but it just identifies um, you know, how everything is connected. So the most common one you'll run into in Illinois is the mass type service. Like I said, it's, it's free of charge. You know, the company will come out and they will connect free of charge. You go underground and that's going to, that's going to run you some money with a, the extra equipment, right? And B, they act, the power company will actually charge depending on how severe the route is. But the minimum is about 2,500 bucks for, uh, for Ameren or ComEd or whoever, uh, come through and trench and put an underground connection in. And they do cover um, the installations for service entrance cables, right? And we have to go through and calculate what size, uh, what size wire we're gonna have to use. And it's also dependent on the line drop, like how far out to the transformer we have to go, right? So we have to size accordingly. <coughs> but yeah, usually the mass services are typical in most areas where, um, you know, the underground service is not installed. Now, there are some states in the United States that there is only underground service. I know California went through some years ago, and you will not see a pole anywhere in the state of California now. They have everything is um, underground statewide. And I think there's a couple, I'm not sure if Nevada's in there or not as well, but there are a couple of states where it is all underground service, but Illinois is not one of them. You can, you can do it, but it's not a requirement. So typically you'll find what they call the mast. It's like a pipe going up. So you have the pipe going up and then what they have on the top is the, uh, the service head or a hood. And it basically it'll have the wiring coming out and there's like a little plastic connection to help guide the wiring through and stuff. And really with that masthead and why it's formed like that, where it's got that uh, curve to it, is, uh, is a rain barrier. Because you don't want water flowing down into the, into the pipe and into your meter and stuff like that, right? So that's why it's got the, the shape that it has. And you, and you can get it in 
believe it or not, you can get it in both the metal versions, right? Where you'll have a galvanized style and you have a P PVC version of this stuff too that they have now. And I think, and depending, you know, it depends, but um, the PVC of course is, you know, corrosion resistant. So you could literally have that thing be there for the lifetime of the, you know, the owner has the house or something. <coughs> Excuse me. But yeah, this is a fairly typical um, layout. Now on the outside, you're also gonna have the, um, the main ground. And they use it in these days, now it used to be where they would actually, were allowed to hook up to the, to the water, the main water pipe coming into the house, but that's a no-no now. So what they'll have is uh, a giant, <laughs> like eight foot tall copper spike, okay? And yeah, you haven't lived until you've had to pound this thing into the ground. But believe it or not, these days, they actually require a triangular configuration where you need three copper spikes pounded into the ground. And generally what you're going to do is you're going to get out and uh, you're going to get in unless you're, unless you're eight foot tall, but you're going to get out with your, your ladder. You're going to grab a hold of this copper rail. Okay. And it's a round. I mean, it's just literally a round copper piece and you're going to take your little sledge your mini sledge and you're going to literally start pounding this thing into the ground and you're only allowed like so much to to be up and over the surface right and you're going to tap onto that and that's going to run back to your box and that's going to be your main uh, building ground you know and this is for protection for you know discharge of course and anything for like lightning and whatnot you know you'll kill a lot of worms if you have something like that, but um, they've had trouble in the past where I guess if you were hooked up to the main water feed where the, the water feed actually became energized, believe it or not. And if you attach copper to like brass, you have a, an electrolysis thing go on where you literally change the metal composition going on where it'll make, you know, the, the water pipe basically become corroded. And so they've stopped doing that. And again, grandfather clause, if you don't change anything, you know, it's still allowed to be, but yeah, the copper rail is very, very typical these days. And this is, this is pretty much a standard, uh, you know, abbreviated, of course, we're not taking links into, into account here, but you'll see the very bottom one is an underground style service, right? And so you're, um, the pipe will feed through underground and then you literally have like this raceway all the way down to so many feet attached to a pipe and then that'll run out and then uh, but it goes it comes up into your meter box <coughs> and then into your service entrance and then the mass style of course where it comes overhead <coughs> and then like i say depending on the pitch of the roof and whatnot is how you'll kind of connect this stuff up so they have some typicals like see in a case of where you have like a flat roof right you do have a uh, uh, a support for the mast that's up overhead. See how it's got the, uh, the little strut running down through that? Well, that'll be a, a support for a flat style roof so nobody could hit it in any which way or cause it to fall or something like that. And then, like I say, depending on the pitch of the roof, you might even re be required to have a, a strap support for your mast that way. But if the pitch is real severe, I don't believe you have to. And then, and again, we have to take it into account, measure, and see from our drawings, and then decide how we're going to connect this thing up. So we do have calculations involved, right? So depending, and it's how far in you have to go, you're not allowed to be um, like on the edge where the the gutters are, that kind of thing. Um, basically, it's basically it's like a safety point of view, right? You don't want it to be anywhere where people are, who get them electrocuted and that kind of thing. And then you're only allowed like so much wire sag as well. You know, you never want this uh, wiring to be hitting the roof, that kind of thing, because eventually that's going to cause some kind of flash or fire or something like that. <coughs> So these are all things that we have to take into account, things that we do have to consider, like I say, the pitch of the roof. And, um, you know, you'll measure out and then, you know, it's like basically like in this one diagram with the, with the greenish figure of the house. So you measure out so much and measure down, basically you're making a triangulation, right? And then you'll figure out that is the, the amount of pitch I have. And then basically you can go back and to compare it to a chart and see, well, do I have this? 
And then that'll be your guideline to, depending on how you're gonna connect your mast up. <coughs> and this is diagram is very, very typical of how you'll see it. See in the meter connect, see how the, the wires literally are um, separated. And really what makes the main connection will be the meter itself. And then of course going into the house, right? And remember, you know, the ground, the ground does not come um, from amber and the ground comes from you. So you're the one that's gonna be basically pulling this in from the outside, from your copper rail. You'll be bringing that um, from the outside and through the house and then into the panel as well. You know, and ground never connects to anything. Basically, it's, it's, it grounds out the instrumentation around the, uh, the service. So in this case, you know, your main ground will be, you'll have a ground bus bar, you'll be grounding the panel out, and then you'll have uh, ground wire feeds going throughout the house, pretty much following where all your, um, your branch circuits are going. But yeah, this is very, very typical. Like I say, at this point, you know, we're kind of, we, like I said, we had that little lab I like to do, and I'll have to go through and add the questions in on Blackboard, but these will be, um, Basically, chapters 27 and 29 deal with this uh, very much. And they do actually a pretty good job, and they reference all the, the proper NEC articles for this and all the considerations that you might have. And so we really basically follow our building drawings, and we're going to go through and calculate. There's, there's literally three pages of calculations where you got to go through, figure out your service entrance, and then um, your branch circuit feeds and everything else. And like I say, page number four has specific directions and formulas for each question number, if you will. Not, not each question, but the, the relevant ones. And here we go. Now, a thing to think about when you do this, and this is the only requirement that you are actually, I mean, you could put these on every connector you have if you wanted to, but the only one that's actually required to have a nylon bushing is where your main service comes into your panel and into your main service uh, disconnect. On that connector, <coughs> excuse me, whichever way it's attached, you know, you're coming through the back of the panel, the top, the bottom, the sides, or whatever, you know, all depends on how it's routed through your house. You absolutely must have a nylon bushing on the end of that connector. And the reason being is they don't want uh, any type of, any kind of, because uh, you know, the connector is typically metal and that's what they're showing here, right? You got to connect a uh, compression connector there or you have the, uh, the cable clamp style. But typically in the outside, you're going to have the weatherproof compression one, right? That's, you always tell when you have compression, if you have the, uh, the bolt style like that, where you're going to basically be using a wrench to turn it on. Electricians and wrenches don't typically happen, but in this case, <laughs> you are going to use it. Generally, most of your outside stuff is uh, done what they call a compression fitting. And if you looked on the inside, you actually have like these uh, compression rings. So that way, when it's when you tighten down to a certain amount, this thing will start kind of like lock in, and it makes a uh, a moisture barrier, you know, to keep moisture out from going into places you don't want it. <coughs> but at the main service coming in and feeding into your house, all right, you do have to have a nylon bushing. It's a, just a little side point, but, um, so yeah, the cable from uh, the underground service, right, like, like I say, you could check with the, uh, your local utility company, and they have, um, and actually they do a, usually a pretty good job, even to the point of drawings, what their requirements are, where you have to trench, where they're gonna have to trench, what kind of equipment you provide and what kind of equipment they provide kind of thing. And it's something to check into, right? So you always wanna make sure that you, you, you have everything there ready for them when they come out. So typically, yeah, you'll have this pad mounted transformer that they bring into, and that's the big green box you'll generally find some point in somebody's yard, right? And then underground, it'll feed through, and then you'll have this, uh, this weird meter socket thing going on where it looks like a long panel that literally goes down to the ground. Um, and then you'll have like a pipe or a, a, a flex depending, it depends on what they allow. Typically I wouldn't recommend doing a flex style with the, with the main service feed, right? I would typically go with, I mean, you are allowed to use PVC underground as long as you're below the frost line, which I think now in the state, 
I think they pushed it now. It used to be 45, but I think they pushed it to 48 inches now, I believe. And so your main service disconnect location. So it has to be a readily accessible spot, right? You can't have it somewhere where somebody's required to climb up and over into something like a crawl space or a ladder or something like that. You have to be able to readily access this thing to be able to quickly turn it off if required. And that means if somebody else from the outside had to come in and turn it off, like fire department or something like that, right? Very typically, they'll go with something like a garage. Sometimes you're allowed to have it in a basement, but a garage is a convenient location, right? It's outside of the house and that kind of thing. <coughs> so, and you got to remember coming up to your main service, there is no... Um, there's no ground fault protection, short circuiting, or anything like that. This stuff is coming and feeding in. If you got a 200 amp service, well, guess what? You got 200 amps coming in on this, on this wiring. So, and again, you know, and I always refer back to in, in our abbreviation from this point, we're going to say AHJ, right? Which is the, the authorized uh, <coughs> having jurisdiction, you know, authorized personnel having jurisdiction. So whenever you see AHJ, that's what we're talking about. And it could be, as you've seen from the examples previously, it could be all kinds of people depending on your area. And again, check, check, see who has the actual jurisdiction. Um, and here's typical pictures on routings, okay? It could be, you know, like I say, in this case, the, the, the one on the left, that's your service coming into a, like a basement style, right? You could tell by the floor joists up on the top. And then in this case here, you'll see it where, all right, see how the mast is located, goes to the meter, and then we have like a little fuse disconnect. But then that main feed branches down and goes to an LB, right? Highly recommended to use LBs on most at uh, certain points in the curves because the, um, anything more than one bend, this wiring is really stiff. Even though it's multi-stranded, it's, it's very stiff. So that first 90, you know, you'd be able to pull the wiring through okay with no problem. But trying to make that second 90, oh my God, you would have to be like... Uh, you you pretty much want to be Hercules if you're the one pulling on the end trying to get this stuff through. So what they'll do with an LB like that, and it has a little uh, little uh, a panel con connection on it, so you're able to unscrew it and take it off. So you would pull the wiring through from the first 90, right? Pull it through, and then you would feed it through like the basement, especially look what they got going on here, right? So you're pulling through, and then you're going through another kind of a long run into another 90, and then down into the panel. So usually when you're dealing with the service, you really only want 190 on a run and then put an LB or something like that in place in between it. So that way you're able to pull this wiring through. Cause like I say, this stuff, even though it's multi-strand, it's usually pretty good size. And when you're pulling three of them together, yeah, it's a, it's a ball breaker. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. They have a, they have stuff they call a goop, well, I don't know what they call it these days, but it's, uh, oh, this stuff is nasty, but Ideal makes it, and it comes usually in big buckets, and you'll you'll slather it on. It's sort of like a, a gritty grease that you can smear onto your cables, but even that, it's still, I would only, you know, you only want 190 on a, on a pull when it comes to the to the service, because every, every 90 you add, adds uh, another stress factor to this thing. And so if you had, you know, a couple of them, yeah, good luck. Anyway, <laughs> so your service disconnect. Now, depending on where your panel is located, the service disconnect may or may not be in the main panel at times. You might have like a little sub panel that'll have the main service disconnect located on it, right? Because of the readily accessible deal where your actual panel is located further. So you would have like this little sub panel here and again, yeah, don't install in a bathroom or uh, anywhere where there's going to be like running water, that type of situation, okay? Because again, this is 200 amps coming, you know, you got to be careful. And so, yeah, you got to be careful. Um, some places will have restrictions on how far of a run you can have before you have the service disconnect. And in which case like this, okay, it's immediately coming into the basement. 
So like I say, you would have just basically all that's in this little sub panel is your service disconnect breaker. And it'll just, so you'll open it up, it'll be your 100 amp breaker, and then it'll feed down to your panel. But, and it's dependent on the area. You get out into the farms and stuff, and it seems like the amount of restrictions they have almost don't exist, and you're allowed to do whatever you want. But rule of thumb, always follow um, a good safe practice. is always the best way to go. And so here's a typical panel layout. You know, you got a 200 amp feed, and both sides are branches, okay? These will be your branch circuits. So on each side is a 120, right? 120 on one side, 120 on the other side. <coughs> and those will match up to your, your two service pools that you have coming in. Neutral doesn't go on a breaker. There's no disconnect for neutral, if you will, because that's the return feedback to the transformer. So your disconnects are always going to be your two hots. That's how they'll have it. And then your two hots feed literally down into you know, your branch feeds like that. That's very typical. And the size, it, it depends. You know, panels will come in, oh my God, so many different um, ways, shapes, and sizes, even to the point at what type of um, breaker style you're going with. There's breaker styles that screw into the panel. There's breaker styles that have like a compression where they literally have tabs on them where it'll mount onto the panel. Like basically you'll have to like hit it a little bit to get it knocked on. But yeah, they come in a lot of different and flavors. All righty. So service disconnect means, okay, how big does your uh, area around it have to be? Well, you have 30 inches wide and 30 and six inches deep, meaning you can't have anything around this thing in this area of space. So from both sides of this of where your disconnect panel and coming out in front of it, there literally has to be this like free zone Okay, it has to be kept clear by requirements. Can't put it in the bathroom. It can't be over any kind of sump pump. Basically, rule of thumb is anywhere there's going to be like some kind of running water. No, keep this thing away. And yeah, and the door has to be like if so when your panel opens up, if you're in a restricted area and you can't fully open the panel at least 90 degrees where you have complete access to this thing, something's got to go. So that's just uh, the NEC requirement for it. And they're not real restrictive, but they do require that you have to be able to get access to this thing easily without any, you know, can't have, a, can't have it be where you have to have a ladder involved or something like that. You had to climb or crawl into somewhere. No, not allowed. And you have to, have to keep the area free and clear. And this applies, believe it or not, because it's NEC 100, okay? This means this applies to everybody, residential, commercial and uh, industrial. So at any time, and you would be amazed, um, <laughs> you'll come into these places and people literally have all this junk piled up in front of the panels and whatnot. And it's like, no, 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 you're not allowed to have that. Well, most people don't know, but yeah, technically you're not allowed to have that. <laughs> so the mounting height, um, see, you're not allowed to have it more than six, seven above the floor. So literally, and even six, seven would be kind of pushing it, right? But you can't, it has to be readily accessible as a way to always look at this. <clears throat> and it has to have room, room around it, room above it, room below it. It's always a good rule of thumb, you know, basically get yourself a nice like half dome kind of clear area going up and going down. And so, and then we talk about sizing. And of course, you know, and this is rule of thumb, right? You gotta watch um, in a case like where they like that one basement where they had a clear run going on there, you're gonna have to do a voltage drop calculation on that and make sure that your wiring is actually gonna be, you know, long enough to make this run. If not, you know, you're gonna size up, right? So we always have to watch, you know, how much drop we have and that's gonna affect how much we have coming in. So typically, yeah, a typical family rise on one family, and this is a smaller, we're talking like a like 12, 1200 square feet home or something like that, where 100 amp service, you start getting over like the 1400 square feet and that kind of thing, you're going to start looking at a 200 amp service for the size of the house. 
Yep. And basically this is something, what do you mean? What we mean by this is all utilities is that's the power company or gas company if they're providing power, who knows, but whoever your local utility is, they will have um, size and guiding requirements for, for the mast. They might require you to be so high up over the roof. Sometimes you're allowed to be up just on the side of the wall, up a certain height. It all depends, you know, in case where you have like a two story home or something like that. But then some places will even on a two story home require you to be up and over the roof by a certain amount as well. So really you have to go back and check what are the local requirements, you know, by the utility company. You know, and there's a lot of factors that you have to go through um, and make sure everybody's happy and you're doing the right job before you actually even begin this job. And again, uh, same deal with this, right? How, where do, where do they want the meter to be? That kind of thing. Again, you would go through and um, check with the utility company. As far as the meter base goes, that's something that's provided by us. And then, like I say, the meter, um, the meter itself does come from a power company. Each one has their own. You can't buy these things, okay? I mean, literally, you cannot buy them. You might get a hold of some uh, older junk ones. And in certain cases, let's say if you were doing like a replacement at a house, you could go ahead and use the existing meter and just snap it on. But of course, when the power company comes out, believe it or not, they'll probably change it. It's just a weird, weird thing they have. Of course, these days, now they've gone all digital, so they'll probably change it anyway. But um, yeah, we go through and look, okay, so how do they average out, you know, and you're, you're talking about the, the watt hour meter, right? Typically, um, we're looking at kilowatts. And what's a kil kilo is uh, 10 to the third, which means we're dealing in thousand, uh, thousand ranges. And so typically over a month, you're going to use so many kilowatts per day. It depends, you know, depends on the usage of the home, that kind of thing. But typically over a given month in a residence, you are going to be in the kilowatt range. How high or low it is all depends on what your usage is, that kind of thing. And this, this is pretty much how the power company goes through and uh, computes what the heck you're going to pay for this, right? So they figure their cost is by this much. So you'll figure out, <coughs> excuse me, how many watts you used over what amount of time. And that's what the dials are on these things. Of course, now you got the digital ones. They're really easy to read, right? They literally tells you each one of these things. You don't have to read a little dial anymore. You can just go and look at the digital readout. I'm not sure if they did that just for everybody or just make it easier for the meter reader or what's the deal. But, and then of course you go by the cost per kilowatt hour. And that's all divided by a thousand. And that comes out to be, you know, how much your, uh, much your cost is going to be, you know, through a given month. So typical example here, right? So, and this, this is one of your biggest uh, energy hogs of a home is usually going to be your central air conditioner. You know, those things run, they're running a lot. This is the, your biggest, if you want to look at your biggest power consumer, you're generally going to have in a home. This is the one right here. Um, so they look at it, right? So we see it runs on an average 50% of the time during a 24 hour period. So, you know, this thing's really cooking, right? And of course the hotter days, it may re run even more. So you look at the units, right? Marked on the nameplate um, for your condenser or whatnot. And it'll tell you what it's marked for. Like in this case, so a typical one, 240 volts, single phase, 23 amps. See, so and then your average rate, yeah, this was a while ago too, I guess, but is nine cents a kilowatt hour. So if we go in a 24 hour period, right, we're running half, 50% uh, of the time, so 0 0.5, that means we've got 12 hours of running in a day. So how do we figure it out? So we go ahead and multiply through and come out that over a given month, we're using uh, 5520 watts, okay, which would be 5.52 kilowatts, which is, could be quite a chunk. And there's how much you would pay. And now remember this here <laughs> is in your typical day. So you're going to spend what, six bucks a day just on your air conditioner. You figure your month, figure average 30 days, right? So six, you're paying 180 bucks just for the air conditioner. And this is average. And I think the rates have actually gone up a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. That's your biggest, uh, your biggest power consumer is this bad boy. And we get into, now this one, 
as a weird concept to, to kind of grasp what they mean by this, okay? What is the difference between grounding and bonding? So grounding is never, ever, ever actually attached to the electrical lines at all, okay? Usually the ground comes through and it grounds out the equipment around the voltage, okay? So in the case of your panel, um, boxes, your receptacles, your switches, the, those devices are grounded. So in case, let's just say something happened and they started to flare up or short out or something like that, what the ground will do is let it readily discharge. And then when it discharges like that, what the premise is is that it would trip the circuit breaker then, right? So causing an immediate short to ground trips the breaker just because of a massive current spike that's gonna happen. <coughs> But the ground itself is never actually attached to anything electrical. It's always on the outside of devices, boxes, panels, that kind of thing. Now bonding, what do we mean by bonding? Now when we bond something, that means we're attaching it together in a way that, um, so let's say we make a splice, okay? Let's say we have a, a bus bar where we have a long thing with a bunch of screw holes in it. We have multi wires coming through it, but it allows a, a junction point, if you will. So bonding means you're literally bonding this thing together. So that way you have um, a current path to that involved, whether it's in a run, you know, you're going in a junction box and you're, you're gonna bond two wires together, you know, splice them. Um, and that's what they mean by that. So whenever they talk about something being bonded, that's typically what they mean. In some way, it's joined together. It may not always be a splice, but if you recall from the last uh, the last slides we did, there was you know the different styles that we could have. So it might have wire connectors. You could have the the posts, that kind of thing. But all of those are meant to bond wire to something. <coughs> Excuse me. Whereas ground ground is an outside of something. <laughs> But that's just what they mean. It's a specific term. And again, like I say, it's how to read the legal speak of the NEC, which is usually the, the fun part. So when you look at a, like a typical, right? So what are our ground points? And notice these, these rails inside of these panels. So those rails are bond points. Now ground might have a bond point, but live wire might have a bond point as well. But what they'll do, so they'll have these posts like this. And what that does is there's like a bunch of little screws and inside on the sides of them, you'll see uh, holes and you're allowed to mount a wire into it and you crank down the screw, you know, a set screw that would clamp onto that wiring. And what that does is it makes a bond point. So you can have, so in some cases, you know, if you try to do a splice with too many wires, it becomes kind of insane, okay? So what you'll do is you'll have these bond posts, <coughs> excuse me, and like a, a panel or something like that, sub panels, that type of thing. Even some cases in junction boxes, if you literally had enough, enough wiring come through, you can buy these little sub posts where you can actually mount them in a junction box. And it'll save you the, you know, the pain because sometimes trying to splice, you know, if you get like five, six wires and you're trying to splice them, it's, it's a royal pain in the ass and I'm not gonna lie. So these bond points become real nice to use. <coughs> But it's not always a bond post. You notice like here where we're, where we're attached to the copper rail, right? Those, those points are also bond points. So wherever you have wiring clamped onto something else, that basically creates a bond. And the purpose of it is to allow electricity at one point to run. And I mean, hopefully you don't have electricity running on your ground, but in case that you need to, it's bonded and gone through and it's allowed a convenient path to short out the ground. And that applies throughout the whole house, um, depending on your service equipment, your panels, what you're allowed to have. In this case, right, you see the, where we have, here's a, your water meter and you have a break in between. So what the bonding jumper does in that case with that wiring is allows to go past that break point because you don't want an interruption on your ground. So if you ever have a point where your ground is gonna be interrupted, this is what you would do is you literally jump around it you've got a, a single post or something like that that clamps on like this and you're allowed to run through. <coughs> and 
So always kind of, you know, take what you're looking at with a grain of salt and go, okay, we need to, we need to follow this ground path through and bypass this, that kind of thing. And these are just different examples like this, like in this case, these are old styles where we would have, um, in some of the cases we were using the cold water line as like a, a ground point or something like that. The main purpose of the ground is basically to provide a convenient way to short out devices in case of excess electricity. Whatever reason that's caused by, you know, you know, get a feedback, some motor blew out or something like that, made a surge, whatever, whatever it is, the device fail, it's not unheard of that receptacles will, will break down or something like that, you never know, but that's the only purpose of a ground. And a bond, a bond is just the connection to allow it to follow through, depending on what we're trying to ground out. So in this case, like in this, right, you're required to have the gas line grounded, just in case of any electrical spark or something like that were to hit the gas line, you know, that would make an explosion in the house. So these type of things, you'll have them grounded just to keep electricity from doing any harm where it shouldn't be. And so pretty much we have, you know, we refer back, you know, what are the requirements from the NEC? How are we going to, how do we ground this out? What kind of length are we allowed to do? That kind of thing. <clears throat> so in a case like this, right, we jump around the water meter. The water meter is energized um, a lot these days. So we got to be careful of that. We want to make a ground point so the water line doesn't become energized at any point. And um, the same with uh, the gas lines and whatnot. And then you have even have different um, styles of what you're allowed to do. Like in the case, you know, if you have concrete coming through the house, concrete being, you know, where the water line might be routed up and over, coming through, coming around, and how we're required to connect up to it. In this case, right, to keep it from being energized at any point and how we're allowed to run back. And what size of wiring we're going to be required to run as well. Um, a lot of cases with this, the ground wire is going to really be actually more on the smaller side, believe it or not, typically like a 14, 16, that kind of size. So it's usually a smaller wire. <laughs> you just got to make sure you use the proper uh, bonding post for it because some of them are like, uh, they have a specific diameter. So you want to make sure that you get the right size for uh, the wiring that you are going to be running. These are all considerations, and this all has to do with um, getting your service set up, right? Because when you get the ground established, you're, you know, from pretty much from the get-go, you have to look through. It's like, okay, what am I going to be required to, to bond here? What am I going to be required to ground out throughout the house? That type of thing. So in this case, yep, you are required to see the, our example, keeping the gas, uh, the gas pipe safe. So typically... Uh, you have a solid run of metal and gas pipe, so you just have to find what bond point you're required to have <clears throat> as long as the uh, as long as it's been done properly right so that's that way it conducts all the way through if you have any interruptions in a gas pipe at all like for i don't know whatever godforsaken reason if they had like some plastic joint or something like that then you would have to make sure that you are bonded on both sides, even a similar example like they used with the water one where you would run a, a jumper up and over to it. But so long as the, the gas pipe is, you know, in case, in, in any case, because typically where do they run this stuff to? To the hot water heater and a lot, and most of them these days are uh, electronic ignition. The gas goes to the uh, furnace and again, electronic ignition. So you do have electricity running to these things. So you do have a possibility that if something were to fail that you would have, you know, this gas line could get energized. And so if you electrically charge up a gas line, you can kind of use your imagination and see, okay, what's gonna happen here? Well, it's not gonna be good. <coughs> okay. So, and here's an example, right? So if you had like um, bonding jumper A going to the gas pipe is coming from the bond from the water pipe. So you gotta be careful as long as your potential remains at zero, you'll be fine. Cause see in the case, the example here, somehow that live wire got energized and hit the gas piping. Um, and hopefully, you know, your overcurrent circuit breaker in this case, or the G, ugh, GFI, right, 
equal trip. Um, but in the meantime, you're still going to be momentarily energized. So you have to be able to allow this thing to, to have a path to ground. And they use the, the water pipe example in this case, but you have to check with uh, your local requirements. In a lot of cases now, you, you will probably have to run um, a separate wire that does go out to the uh, outside ground of the house. So that way it's protected that way. But in some of the cases, you are allowed to use the water pipe as a ground point. But I think that's more and more gone away with more recent um, NEC changes. But, and they'll cover it, right? So you look up any NEC, and in this case, we're in uh, the Article 200, okay? What kind of, um, how the grounding electrode has to be connected as far as the service conductor goes, right? What were our outside requirements going to be? what size uh, rail we're gonna have to have. And like I mentioned, where we would even have to have the, the triangulation spikes where we're literally required to have three posts driven in the ground. And it depends on the service and your local jurisdiction and everything else to decide. And usually in some cases like this, if you go with what you know and you go, and even if it's an overkill, it's like, well, I know it's gonna be safe, that kind of thing. Just keep in mind, if you have to do, uh, we were only required to do one single copper rail, and we're talking an eight foot rail, those things aren't exactly cheap, if you will. <coughs> and everything usually like um, switches, and receptacles, or ever service equipment, even inside panels, the green screw is the ground screw. These will be in junction boxes, service boxes, raceways, sometimes you'll have them pre, they'll pre, pre-drilled, okay? And inside will be a green bonding screw. Well, as long as you provide a path to it, you can use that as a junction point, right? Wrap your, uh, wrap your copper loop around it, tighten it down, and now you've basically made a bonded ground point. <laughs> but yeah, green, the green hexagon screw is very, very typical as the, uh, the bond point. Yeah, and ground rods, yep, they'll usually be uh, copper clad. These things are big, I see, never less than eight feet. And so it has to be able to make contact with the soil, depending, you never know what kind of environment you're dealing with. If you have a certain amount of gravel or whatever over the top, right, you still have to be able to drive down to a, a good range that you are in, uh, in the soil. So our key terms from this, right, Things, things to know or be familiar that you think you know. It's like, what is ground? What's a grounded conductor? What do we mean when we say a grounding equipment conductor, right? Um, what a ground fault is, our ground fault current path, the grounding of electrical systems and equipment, and a grounding electrode. Basically are things that you want to keep in mind. And remember, these are separate, um, even though they may share, these are separate terms and it's something that uh, the NEC refers back to always. So be familiar with it and what they mean by it. So that way, when you read the, the lawyer speak of the NEC, you know what they're referring to, right? In this case, our bonding point, how, how things are bonded together, what we're allowed to bond and how long we're allowed to bond, what are run, you know, what kind of clamps we're allowed to use to bond and that type of thing. So, and that's what they mean by this. And so the chapter as well, be familiar with what they're referring to and, and try to get familiar with that. So, and these are um, connections. So how, how we attach things, you could have a snap ring, um, you have a lock nut, which is the middle style. The snap ring is all the way over on the right. And the, the one on the left is a PVC style that also locks down, right? And notice that since it's PVC, what they've, what they've added is uh, an outside like metal attachment, if you will. So that way you have a, a bonding point as well. So these are all things that can be bond points to use when attaching to equipment. <coughs> and that, my friends, is chapter 27 and grounding and bonding. And then when we get into chapter 29, that's when we actually start getting into uh, the service load and stuff like that. And it isn't too much longer. Do you guys need to take a little break or anything or is this going okay? Right. No, it's good so far. Okay. I mean, I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot, you know, and this is dry stuff, right? 
anytime you're talking, you know, I basically always tell my wife, it's like, yeah, if I ever need to go to sleep, I just basically grab a good technical manual and sit there and read it for about five minutes. And usually that'll do it. But, <laughs> but uh, so now we look at the, the service entrance and this one, there's not as much material to cover. Really, a lot of this stuff is uh, calculating and deciding what your loads are. And again, like I said, I had that exercise for the lab, which I'll be going through and shush, ducks. And, uh, attaching through um there's three pages of calculations to look through and these refer whenever they refer you know go back look at the drawings that's what they're talking about is the building drawing so if you have the prints great and if not remember i got them uh, electronically on blackboards so you can always refer back to those but yeah all those all those calculations are going back to the building prints that we have with our textbook <coughs> so so these days you're not allowed to have a minimum of 60 amp service. That used to be, but now the very, very minimum, any uh, new new dwelling that's being erected would have to have at least 100 amp service. And more and more these days, you'll even see that that's becoming kind of rare, okay? Where a lot of times your minimum service would be about 150 amp service and more common than not is the 200 amp. And even in the case, uh, a lot of times these days, you know, the 200 amp service might be overkill, but you never know, uh, you know, 10 years down the road, if you plan on staying in this house for, for a while or your lifetime, you know, even if you don't need the power now, getting a 200 amp service wouldn't be a bad idea because you don't know, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now what you might need. And that's even a selling point to use for like the, the homeowner, you know, let's say they're having you come in and and doing a new service and, and they're, they had a tight budget, even still, it's not a bad idea to go through and get a 200 amp service, you know, and a, and a decent sized cabinet that has like, you know, some expandability to it. And granted, they'll pay more for the, you know, the, the 200 amp breaker, of course, is gonna be more than the lesser ones and the same with the panel, but you're still not gonna populate the entire panel. So as far as that cost goes, you're still, running the same as if you did the 150 and 100 amp service. The only extra cost that they're really gonna have is gonna be the, you know, the disconnect breaker and uh, the panel itself. But, and I would recommend it. If I were doing my house, I would definitely go with the 200 amp service at this point, right? But you never know, there's situations, maybe contractor, you know, you're subcontracting or, you know, the main contractor just general says, nope, this is what we're putting in. You got 150 amp service, like all right, then that's what we're gonna do. So, how do we do it? So, this one gives you an example. Um, and this again, I do have a worksheet, excuse me, that goes back and it'll show you how to do this. Um, but you are required to do this, and this is very, very typical, like what you would do if you just first got your uh your building drawings to do your job bit. It's like you're gonna have to figure this stuff out based on how much square footage you have. So a lot of electric companies will have their own version of this, right? With their own letterhead on it and that kind of thing. Excuse me. But remember from before when you did the, the lighting, right? We relied on how much square footage of the residence you had. Well, that's gonna work very much with this as well. Now we run into something, all right. So when we talk about BA, now remember BA, is not watts and watts are not BA, right? BA is our ampacity, our ability to deliver. So like a 20 amp breaker doesn't mean we're always running 20 amps. 15 amp breaker doesn't mean we're, even the 200 amp disconnect, you know, we're not always, we're hopefully not, good God, your meter box will be spinning like a mad dog if you're constantly pulling 200 amps to your house. I couldn't even imagine, but in any case, that's what we see when we see that term BA, that means the ability, the capability of it to deliver. It can deliver this much. So, and that's what we mean by it. So when they say apparent power, that's what they're talking about. It's like, okay, so we, we have a 200 amp disconnect. We can pull 200 amps if we absolutely had to. God forbid you ever should have to, but <laughs> I wouldn't even want your electric bill. But, uh, and so then we get into something they call the RMS value. Now, I don't want you to get into the math or anything like that, but 
you're going to deal with RMS when you deal with voltage. And this is usually something that um, even your meter will do for you. So you go and look and it's like, oh, wait a minute, I'm only getting 115 here. And it's like, I should have 120. And yeah, you should have 120. But RMS value is always a little bit than less than what your like actual peak value is, right? Which would, you know, your, <coughs> excuse me, peak to peak value of this sine wave coming in, AC, right? I don't wanna get into a, a major thing. We're not gonna do any major calculations with this, but they do refer back to our RMS voltage and our RMS uh, current. And RMS is the value they use on the meters. And you go and look on equipment, usually they refer back to its RMS. And so getting familiar with this term and what they mean by that is root mean square. And basically what that is, is the uh, allowable power that you're actually able to use. So even if I said, okay, I'm giving you 140 volts peak to peak, you're not gonna use 140 volts peak to peak. You're gonna use the RMS of that, which would be like the 120 or 110. But that's what they're talking about with that. Just just don't let these terms get you confused or anything like that. That's what they're referring when they say RMS, you know, RMS voltage or RMS VA. <coughs> so then we go through and refer back and, and again in the article 200, right? So section 200 of the, the NEC, which is in the very beginning. Um, so if we look at 230.42, uh, it tells us that the service entrance conductors have to be sufficient to carry the load as calculated. So we have two methods of doing this. So the conventional method, you know, the one that pretty much everybody used, you can find in Article 220, Part 3, and it'll show you a formula. And there's an optional method as well that's also in 220, but you'll see that one's in Part 4. <clears throat> and I believe the Uglies book has it referred as well. So you can look and see, okay, what's my service entrance calculations going to be? And there are factors involved, okay? I'm not going to lie. And, and, it real, and it does depend on what kind of uh, material you're going to use, if it's going to be copper or aluminum, that type of thing, how much your VA is and, oh, and whatnot. But we have correction factors as well. And again, we find these. See, a lot of times we don't have to do all the math. They're usually in these tables and charts for us already laid out. And you just go and mat, mix and match and see what it means, you know, for you. So, and here's a very, and this, I have on my worksheet, this is exactly the same way for this. See how on the sides there, it says, this is step one, step two, three, and four. Well, on page four of this worksheet, it'll tell you what you're, you're gonna be doing. So we look in the very first one, right? You see, it says, okay, what's your square foot of your house, the, your house times your three watts, and that's gonna be how much BA you're gonna need. That means, that's how much power you're going to have to be able to deliver, not all the time, but, you know, as your, uh, your overall ampacity. And then we do, you know, now we start to step down and break it out. You know, how, and what this, this worksheet does is it helps you figure out what your branch currents are going to be, what your branch circuits are going to be, how many you're going to need overall for the size of the house. And again, it always refers back to, um, the overall square footage of the house, you know, independent rooms. Okay, this room A over here is this size. It's going to have to have this. Room B over here is smaller, so it has this, that type of thing. And that's really what's going on through the whole worksheet. Everything is always in BA. So that just means like that. So what you're doing is being able to size the circuit breakers of these things. <coughs> okay, uh, how much power you need to be able to deliver. And then it goes through, and these are specifics, right? So for each appliance, you're gonna have one breaker for this appliance. So your water heater, it's gonna have a breaker. Your dishwasher, it's gonna be on its own breaker. Um, the garage door opener, hopefully, and not like that, that video I showed you. But see, each one of these things like this are each um, appliances, right? They're, even if they're fixed appliances, they're still considered an appliance of the house and they are wired separately. There's no other feed of, involved with this. So these things are literally, and it's gonna take up space in your panel, right? So like your water heater, uh, circuit breaker, and this one, and you'll mark your panel accordingly. But we have to calculate that all in as our overall, like how much, you know, how much we're required to run through this house. And we have uh, factors involved, okay, depending on what type of appliances they are. 
and figuring out our motor loads. So you have to figure, you know, because your AC motor loads, your dishwasher has its motor and so on and so on. So you look at all the appliances involved and then we figure out, okay, so how much is this going to, you know, be requiring? And that's what the whole worksheet does. And we just get into some little fun stuff. And basically, if you get to the end and your stuff looks like this, you've done a really, really bad job. No. <laughs> and believe it or not, this is, um, this is really actually, this was really done. These are real live pictures that an electrician was called out to, uh, to perform service on these houses, okay? And then you walk in and you see this nightmare. And then you got to ask yourself, am I really going to, do this job i mean do you really want to would you want to actually get involved with this nightmare mess and i don't know it depends on how many headaches you really want to have okay and there's do's and don'ts you know how things are routed now when you do go through um like a service panel and see that was one of the things because at the end of the class that's that's your last lab is you're required to route your wiring through and the rule of thumb is you always follow the outside. You want to keep the, um, the middle as free and clear of wiring as possible. So you route it from the outside and bring it into the post that you want to deliver to in this case, right? So on this panel here, you see it's nice and neat. The wiring's not in a way, even bent to when it comes out of the breakers there, it's even bent and following a certain chase way, right? Because you don't want anything in the way of, so let's say further down the road, see how you'd have a, uh, empty spots in there you might want to bring another um, another load in you know so you're going to run another service through that and it's like okay i don't need you know this pain and that's something to consider when you're doing this i always want to what i always call and i i always stress this on my class when you get done with your work it better be pretty and i mean i want it to be pretty you want to be able to look at that and go you know that was a nice job right there if your wire looks like it's just been jumbled in, like a jumbled mass or something like that, no, 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 no. When you go into these panels, route it on the sides, you know, you bring it in through the piping. It's in the bottom and the top and the sides, even from the back, it all depends on which way it's gone through, right? But route it accordingly, you know, give yourself that extra length, if you will, but route it nicely. You don't want to run it over, ever, ever, ever over, because remember, you're also going to have to, a cover to put on these things and by and by rights these um circuit breakers are literally meant to have the cover in place if you ever look at the a panel with the circuit breakers on there and you have knockout tabs that literally fit over the breaker like a flush mount okay and that's that tension is meant to be there and it's meant to <coughs> protect a protect you know any from buddy from the outside from being able to get into this live voltage right but it's also meant to, to help hold those circuit breakers in place because without it you're losing a whole tension point and that's why they do make the knockouts like they do and they do they don't fit around the breaker they fit on the breaker and the reason being is you want that tension there See, and look at that. Now you compare the left one and then look at the right one, okay? And the right one, oh, oh good God in heaven, I wouldn't, <laughs> if I walked down and seen that, I would literally just turn around and walk away because I, I would have to tell the homeowner, it's like, you know, you're going to have to, this whole house has to be redone and it would be a nightmare. You know, it's one thing when you're doing, what the hell? I don't know what happened there, sorry. It would be a nightmare anyway. But yeah, you want neat jobs. You can see how this mast is? That's not allowed. There's no, there's literally no support. Somebody or something could come along and hang on that, right? And that's that's the reason why you would mount supports to your mast is prevent uh, anything, any point where anything or anybody, any, you know, even a tree limb were to fall or something like that and hit it, you don't want anything to be able to hang on your pipes. I hope that makes sense. There are do, oops, my bad. There are do's and don'ts. Yeah, look at this creative number. The guy literally used a, uh, a bucket and look on the side there, he's got his, uh, 
hopefully this is only for like construction work or something like that, you know, to give you a, a service hookup. Because if this is the for real deal, good God in heaven, I wouldn't even want to imagine. But uh, yeah, yeah. And there's a good, uh, so remember when I was saying before, you're only allowed uh, to stuff a box with like so much wiring, right? Well, somebody got a little carried away on the size of this box. And on the uh, left-hand picture, notice how the uh, panel is, I mean, the thing is literally right over the bathtub, okay? What the hell? You're not allowed to do that. Because look, what happens when you go and take a shower? You got that little uh, receptacle right there. I wouldn't even <laughs> imagine. But, uh, yeah, here's a fail. Again, uh, you're not allowed to have a service panel in the bathroom. Not at any time, ever, ever, ever. Yeah, if it's going in the bathroom, then you might as well forget it. And that, my boys, is uh, pretty much my lecture for the day. I hope, uh, hopefully that was some good stuff, too. You know, there's going to, you'll see, you'll see. I call it uh, carpenters and plumbers doing electrical jobs because it's not their main deal, right? So they're going to go through and just route it like they see fit. But you're going to see that one day is going to come in your life. You're going to walk in and look at this nightmare and go, oh, Jesus, what is this? You know, and then you have to really ask yourself a couple of questions. It's like, hey, do I need the money this bad? And, <laughs> and then uh, B, do you actually really want to truly deal with this nightmare of a, of a job? But, you know, it depends. I, uh, I had a guy out in, uh, when I lived in California for a while. I wasn't doing electrical work there anymore. I was doing um, electronics uh, engineering stuff. But... One of our neighbors down the block, my uh, my wife was friends with them, and and literally half their house was without power, right? So uh, so my wife asked me the one day if I'd go down there, and I was like, yeah, I got my I got my meter, you know, I always have I always have a meter. It's just once you're an electrician, you're pretty much always an electrician. But so I grabbed my meter and walked down there, you know, and um, I was checking some stuff out. And so I go to the legs on uh, the one end, and yeah, literally they had no juice at all. And I'm going back to the panel. None of the breakers are tripped or anything, right? Well, her husband added some stuff through, and uh, <laughs> he literally took the, uh, the neutral and split it into two junctions, but didn't, uh, didn't connect them together. So the neutral on the one side was going nowhere. So, of course, you didn't have a, a return path for current, right? Whereas the other half was just fine. So I literally, uh, I, well, I kind of doctored it up a little bit, but I spliced them all together and got everything all connected. And a miracle, uh, the woman was so happy. She's like, oh, my God. She, I guess they had had uh, been almost a year. And you would almost think, it's like, well, work your way backwards. What was the last thing you did and before you lost power here? But... He was a mechanical engineer, I think, or something like that. But he was a mechanical guy trying to do electrical work and, and, and total fail. But yeah, you know, stick to what you know. I, I, won't, uh, I won't pretend to be able to do complex uh, repair jobs on automobiles. And you pretend not to do a complex electrical <laughs> repair job. And we'll be fine. But yeah. But... Yeah, that's what I have. Are you guys have any questions so far? Is everything going okay? Hey, stop it. I'm trying to talk. But, I mean, if you guys have any questions for anything, or everything's going along okay. Uh, for th the homework, this is chapter 27 is due tomorrow, but there's no, there's no chapter 27 still on the, on, on the textbook section. Wait, what's going on? On the homework, it says you do chapter 27, but there's no chapter 27. There's no the, on you haven't posted on the, the the on the textbook section of the course content textbook se section about the you haven't released chapter 27. The people don't have the book. It's for day six. No, hold on. That was day five, right? Got here. 
So what's wrong with that? There's no um for the under course content or under under course content textbook. There's no chapter twenty seven. Oh shit! You know what? I was totally sorry about that, Jared. I forgot, didn't I? Yeah, we need twenty seven, twenty eight, and twenty nine, don't we? My bad. I'm sorry, buddy. All right, I'll uh, if I can extend the homework that we do Monday, but me uh, hey, I I could do I, as long as as long as you get. Get 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 in there. Get get on black I could, It's uh, it's only it's due midnight tomorrow, right? Yeah, I can make it. What well, I can make it due midnight tomorrow, or even over the weekend. Really. Well, I think it still says the course calendar says it's it's due midnight tomorrow. No? I think it says that. Yeah, it does say tomorrow. Yeah, so I I can get done. I can I can get done by then. Right. I saw I just wanted, I, just, I just I couldn't do it before because still there's no there was no. I sorry. Yeah, I know. I meant to. I'm gonna pull that up right now so I don't forget. But I meant to do that, and then yeah, I got. Let's see here. Yeah, we need. Yeah, the other homework done. That's need. That's the only homework homework I have left over this weekend to do. Aside from the Monday stuff, to do, I do Monday. I'll probably do it this weekend. Yeah, because we need. Pretty sure that's the only later chapters too. Is 27, 28, and 29. Oh yeah, I, see. I got. Uh... All right, now I'll make sure I get. I gotta go through this and find out where. Ah. Make sure I have this. Yeah, and I gotta go through and post the. Uh, the question well, the service entrance calculate and there's an article due too by the way um but the service entrance one that was meant to be a lab and like i say you go through your building drawings and uh, the, article, the articles do monday or 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 for or, 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 or tomorrow uh, let's take a look it's on the course it's on the course calendar <laughs> I don't think I have it. I got voltage drop and minimum lighting ones. Um, Cause I haven't really assigned. I usually allow you guys like a week or more to do it. Cause like it's a lab, but it's kind of lengthy. And I figure in the very beginning, cause you guys have never done, you know, and that's the whole point of it, right? You guys have never done this before. So I wanted you, you know, that way if you have questions, you come back at me and stuff. Cause it is, a, it's a lot. It's a lot. I'm not gonna lie. Making crazy. Yeah, I gotta go. Well, I'll go through it. I'll make sure I get that posted up. I gotta figure out what I have. I have so many different textbook things right now. It's kind of crazy. I'm not sure why. All right, yeah, I'll have it up. I got, uh, let's see here. Yeah, we got the Uglies book is up. We got the drawings up. But all right, now I'll make sure I have that up too, and then we should be uh, good to go. It should be, up, it should be, it should be up in a couple hours, right? Probably a couple hours. Hey, bare minimum. No, I'm down. Well, because I got them on. Uh, the Google, my Google Drive. I just got to download them to my computer and then post them from there on the Blackboard. So I'm downloading. So it should be online. It should, it should be. It should be on there in like less than an hour. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm just downloading them now, so I'll make sure. I'm gonna basically see what I have here. Okay, I got. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and post all of them from 22 to. It looks like chapter 33 is the final one. 
And then I'll just go ahead and post all those so they're all up, you'll have them available to you. Just for reference and stuff like that. So if you want to, you know, download them or whatnot. It is kind of convenient sometimes to have an electronic copy of this stuff. But yeah, within the hour, those should be all posted. And we'll have that all. I'm totally sorry about that. <laughs> One of those things. Hopefully this all works. This will be my internet failure point. No. But otherwise, everything else is going pretty good for you guys. I mean, I like I say, I know it's a lot. And it is a lot of material, but we do need to cover it. It's like a lot of stuff to look at. And this way you'll know by the time you get done with all this, you'll you know, you'll have pretty much all the working knowledge to be able to go through and, uh, and and approach a house and that kind of thing. And then you'll even be able to go through and like if you wanted to add stuff or fix things that are in your own house, just remember cautious and never work on anything live. Big rule of thumb, no live. I mean, even to this day, I I, I hesitate to work on live stuff. I will if the case, you know, if the situation calls for it, but that's definitely one of those ones where you gotta take everything with a grain of salt and really look at what you're uh, what you're dealing with. Cause it doesn't take much to electrocute you. But, but all right, yeah, I'll have that posted up and then uh Anything else you guys need? Well, you know how to get a hold of me. You absolutely need to. It's easy to text me, I promise. I don't always answer right away, right away, but I do try to get back fairly quickly. But, yeah, let's see. Right, this should be getting downloaded. But all right then, so gentlemen, I will talk to you on Monday. And if, like I say, if you need anything, you know, get a hold of me over the weekend or whatever you need to. And if you have any questions, I, I mean anything, on all the works, oh my God, or on these worksheets or any of that kind of thing, you know, let me know and uh, we'll go over. I mean, we can even jump on on the Zoom thing here if we have to. I can even show you, you know, show you, show you that kind of. Okay. All righty. Mm. Oh, you guys. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Okay. I'm going to stop with